Maybe we just start by uh, opening our hearts, just for five minutes, and just let go of everything. Everything so far, just let loose. The whole space around you is completely opening up. Relaxing any bit of tension, any thought, just letting go, letting go, letting go. Smile. Like a fresh gust of wind in all directions, feel love suffusing everything it touches, every being, and merging into the universe. Being the universe and being love at the same time. See how everything just quiets down. This is happy, this is joyful, boundless love.
letting go into this boundless awareness of love and joy. where we don't even need to carry our own names. So light. Let this be the introduction to the subject today, which will be the Buddha's special samadhi. The samadhi special to the Buddha. slowly without forcing or doing much really <laughs> just allowing yourself to be here and open ready to welcome the Dharma So this uh, very special topic today, <laughs> very special day, <laughs> and um, this particular teaching, um, which we can find in very very few sutta, it's very sneaky. <laughs> we need to know about it, <laughs> and it's very important for us especially because we really do practice that which um, the Buddha special Samadhi I mean this could be a very long topic <laughs> but um, I, I am trying to uh, um, stay around one I always have always what I have to do I have to take a little chunk of <laughs> the Dharma <laughs> and try to stay with this one because you know, it's always easy to go into more but um, maybe looking at uh, isolating a, l uh, a little part of it which touches upon this um, unforced Samadhi which is not bent forward or leaning back which is one of the translations that is often given uh, cha bina, uh, abinato and apan, apanato and that is not um, 
obtained by forcefully suppressing hindrances when they, they arise and is not uh, bent on controlling the mind. It's actually a very open type of samadhi. And this is exactly our practice and this um, sometimes sometimes uh, it's good to have the references for what we do uh, exactly <laughs> from the suttas because then we it, we gain a lot of faith we gain a lot of confidence in what we're practicing so when we read these suttas where the buddha is actually saying it <laughs> it feels very strengthening and really beautiful because this is when we can really relate to the buddha himself also his state of mind what he taught because he taught his his state of mind basically <laughs> so that when we think about that when we pause and think about that for a moment it's quite it's quite amazing to cultivate the mind of of a buddha or <laughs> very close to that how that must feel <laughs> mm. I, I often said um, um, sometimes when I uh, come across uh, situations I don't know what to do or I don't know and then I say what what would the Buddha do <laughs> what would what would the Buddha do <laughs> and, <laughs> and actually Sa Sarah said her mom has a, a, a magnet on her fridge <laughs> says that i was like oh that's great <laughs> that's a good mom <laughs> um but this is this is also a place where we we find just uh, some more qualities that uh, that explain uh, how how that samadhi works and how how it is um and so this sequence, I, I will be reading one of the suttas where we can find the sequence in. This is the unforced samadhi. It's just called Ananda Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya. And um, it's in the Book of Nines because there's nine aspects. But um, uh, mainly we're, we're, we'll be looking mainly at the last aspect of, of these nine. And... Um, there's three other suttas where this comes up, where that description, or very close to that description comes up. And one of them is, in, I put in the book as actual support for the meditation in the o uh, fully open uh, section, right after the instructions, because I thought this was very important for, for everybody to know uh, how... Um, and just so you know, this is very close to Im immeasurable samadhi, measureless samadhi also. Uh, apamanya cannot be measured. It's not. And I couldn't remember, I think I gave, I spoke about these these uh, four samadhis, these four kinds of samadhis. The, there is the signless, signlessness, and uh, there was the measureless, signless, and... Um, I can't remember the other one. But, and then there was the unshakable one uh, that was like the same. Do you remember that? I think that was a teepee. Were you there, Paul? Well, well, it's it's a it's a particular discourse where um, it's actually Chitta, a householder, who's who was known to be one of the most advanced householder disciples of the Buddha. And um, he actually teaches a monk <laughs> what, <laughs> what, these, um, uh, what these four types of samadhis are and how they are different, different in names and different in meaning and how they are similar in, in meaning and different in names only to really use the words that they're using here. Um, and they, they say basically that they're different, like the measureless samadhi is, is the Brahma Viharas usually, that's how we understand that. Uh, the, um, oh, 
well that's okay i think i don't want to spend too much time because that's another i give a whole other talk on this thing so <laughs> i have to control myself <laughs> restraint <laughs> mm, and so um yes any anyways and then there was this signless signless uh samadhi which is you know not paying attention to any signs one enters the signless samadhi and, and oh and the one before that was um nothingness also yeah. voidness and nothingness and how these four samadhis are like they it's like the buddha would just be describing the same thing but actually they're different they're they're not completely you know they're the buddha teaches many things in different ways for a reason <laughs> and they're different practices that lead to the same place which was akupa samadhi the unshakable samadhi which is close to the uninterrupted samadhi oh that was the un uninterrupted samadhi talk <laughs> okay we're figuring time and space but unfortunately this one uh, no no record of that one <laughs> it's just in the mind sati <laughs> hopefully we got good sati and um we um we touched a bit about that and that's that those are other qualities of the buddha's teaching and his st state of mind that he taught and it's a lot about boundlessness and nothingness and voidness and it sounds like it's very open and very you know very empty <laughs> and so um and then he, he would uh, bring it all down to uh, then they're they they're all similar in meaning as the the highest liberation of mind the highest samadhi is the unshakable samadhi and then he says uh, greed hate and delusion are makers of measures but uh, because he's comparing it to the measureless greed is a maker of measures uh, hate is a maker of measures uh, of, of something that you can measure that's something that we kind of that will bring you down that will course coarsen your mind if i may say and then uh, he says but the unshakable samadhi is rid of greed rid of hate rid of delusion and in that sense it is measureless also and then he says uh, uh, greed is a maker of things uh, hate is a maker of things and delusion is a maker of things and but the unshakable samadhi is the highest uh, samadhi of nothingness because that would be the plane of nothingness and uh, he says uh, the same thing with signs greed is a maker of signs hate delusion are makers of signs and the highest signless meditation is the unshakable samadhi so uh, that's very very profound and very skillful we can we can kind of <laughs> think about that for a while but this is quite profound and this is this is not too far from this uh, this talk and so just so you know just the second introduction i guess <laughs> appropriate to ask a question mm -hmm. now yes instead yes of the end. no that's okay uh, i get it unshakable samadhi mm -hmm. but it's not just a meditation within meditation this is here and now all always unshakable samadhi yes yeah that the or i mean that that's what i'm trying to understand you know like in and of samsara is was the buddha unshakable samadhi while he was teaching while he was yes living in the samsaric world he I I am very like I'm summarizing that sutta because uh, I, I I wanted to kind of loop back to it to uh, connect, right. but um, there's m more that is being said, and he says the, the unshakable samadhi is basically the the, f the fruition of uh, full awakening. Basically, right. so it's, it's, it's it's always there. Yeah, it's, always there. It's, yeah. it's not because there's no more greed, hate, and delusion. The mind yeah. cannot. There's no more of these five hindrances. There's no more personification of anything. There's not taking self as anything anymore. And when, when there's no more self, 
I mean, there's no more ignorance. There's no more, there's no more, and there's no more ground for hindrances. All hindrances are rooted in I. So <laughs> every time there's a distraction coming up, whatever it is, it's always me taking it personal. <laughs> so, so, but slowly we, we are, and samadhi, the, and the more we practice this collectedness of mind, the more, the, the closer, this is the closest the mind can be to understanding, like living, experiencing this state of mind. Because it's, it needs to be free. It needs to be, it needs to let go of the hindrances. And then we start to see, because there's no more association. There's no more, like, there's things arising and then we, we keep letting them go and we go deeper. And But then there's a, fruition where when we practice this a lot and then it becomes it just becomes unshakable and then it, it just doesn't leave that's the other way that the buddha would put it <laughs> he would good go <laughs> <laughs> yes 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 and that uh, obviously these pers these people cannot uh, have any kind of like longing for the senses in in like in the best meaning of the sense possible they cannot become angry. They cannot. They cannot dis like dislike. Be averse, aversive to something. They just. I mean, they just see as it is. It's just what, whatever is, happening is happening. There is no more laziness or dullness of mind. There is. Um, um, when when I was talking to Belson. <laughs> Uh, they were doing all these these tests, uh, and we, we were talking about these results, and um, they couldn't f figure out um, when he was in Naroda or when he was sleeping. It was very, very, very similar, and they were asking, but were you really sleeping? <laughs> because we can see that you're aware. <laughs> well, that's what it means, is that you sleep there is sleep but there's awareness of the sleep so it's strange to to us but <laughs> but that's that's also the laziness so there's no there's no more the mind is con continually aware sharp there's no other anything else um and restlessness obviously is also not there so uh, and doubt is th these are usually the five hindrances senses uh, hate or aversion uh, laziness or dullness of mind restlessness and doubt and these are just the ground the root for them are just cut off so and that's why the unshakable samadhi he says the the those distractions the root of all defilements has been cut off at the root made like a palm stem done away with they're no longer subject to future arising <laughs> <laughs> they cannot arise it's like when you cut a palm tree it doesn't grow like it doesn't shoot anymore it's just it's done so um and this is this is this is on the same topic but um with uh, the flavor of unforced and so, so uh, uh, that it's not by suppressing or controlling the mind that we attain this collectedness which so many times is called concentration which for us is it's not concentration proper it is actually understanding how the mind works and cultivating the wholesome states that will create these causes and the mind will just become collected. No need to force it. Um, and that's another interesting use of the word sa uh, sankara, because it also means force. Sa, sa sankara is like forcefully. So that's another interesting. Uh, anyhow, we'll just uh, <laughs> see through the sutta. <laughs> So this is Ananda Sutta in the Book of Nines, and this is a this is a actually a really um, for those who are interested in uh, samadhi and jhana and really the 
The Book of Nines is obviously a good place to look because there's nine jhanas with Naroda. <laughs> and this is in this particular really good section. It's about uh, right in there. So there's a few good suttas and this is one of them. And at that time, the Venerable Ananda lived in Kozambi at the Park of Debates. There he addressed the monks, saying, Monks, friend, they replied. The Venerable Ananda said this, How amazing, friends, and how unbelievable is this, that the beloved teacher, Bhagavan, who knows and sees an arahant, perfectly all-awakened Buddha, has realized and broken through to an opening in the midst of oppression, which purifies living beings, overcomes sorrow and anxiety, appeases pain and depression, and produces understanding which culminates in Nibbana. I think we can even just pause in awe <laughs> just with this statement. I think it's quite, quite powerful to, uh, it's not even really related to uh, the actual subject that <laughs> I'm going to speak about, but <laughs> it's quite, um, I think it's, it's one of those udanas, one of those, you know, inspired sayings that are, that are quite, um, quite amazing. Like, how amazing is this, that there's this Buddha, you know, that just broke through to understanding, because it's a very rare thing in the, in the suttas and the vinaya, they say even, some, sometimes it's even said, just hearing the word Buddha is rare in this world. And some suttas, we, somebody we said, did you say Buddha? <laughs> I said Buddha. Did you say Buddha? <laughs> and obviously they say it three times, right? <laughs> Did you say Buddha? I said Buddha. <laughs> and so they're like, <laughs> okay, I got to meet this person. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> because it's just, can you imagine, like, it's never happened before. And, you know, nobody's heard about that before. And now there's this person who's like proclaiming he's a Buddha <laughs> and it's like whoa okay <laughs> what does that even mean the, for all the other traditions that existed at that time that said many things this this was completely new this was like uh, oh okay <laughs> so what did he break through and that's what he's explaining whereby the eye still exists and so do forms but one does not experience the, that sense field, whereby the ear still exists, and so do sounds. But one does not experience that sense field, whereby the nose still exists, and so, does, so do others. But one does not experience that sense field, whereby the tongue still exists, and so do tastes but one does not experience that sense field, whereby the body still exists, and so do tangibles, but one does not experience that sense field. And this is all these times that we hear that the Buddha teaching, the meditation is, is not related to the world, it's beyond this world. It's said so many times, it transcends this world. And um, this is a bit another way of saying this, in the, the world to the Buddha, when the Buddha uses the word world, he talks about the six senses. Uh, so basically, and the mind is one of the senses in Buddhism. <laughs> the, in, to the Buddha, mind is just another sense faculty. It, it governs all the other ones. It, they all kind of culminate in the mind, but mind is still just a sense, sense faculty. And so that's why also it's so profound, this teaching, going beyond all those senses. When this was said, the Venerable Udayi asked the Venerable Ananda, But friend, would this person be conscious while not, experienced, while not experiencing those sense fields, or would be unconscious? 
which is fairly good, fairly good reasoning. It is, friend, while being conscious that a person would not experience those sense fields, not while being unconscious. But then, friend, what would a person be conscious of when not experiencing any of these sense fields? Oh, it's getting interesting. <laughs> okay. Here, here, friend, by going beyond the perception of forms, now you might start to be familiar with what I'm going to say, while the awareness of sensory contact fades away, not paying attention to the complexity of diversity, knowing there is endless space, one experiences and abides in the plane of endless space. So, of course, now he's explaining the Arupa jhanas, the formless or the immaterial uh, realms, which um, is an another way to, uh, to explain how one could be in a samadhi, in a state of mind, in a state of collectedness, and not experience the senses. And that just means, really, it's not that if there's a sound, you won't get to hear it. For that moment, you'll hear it. Maybe if if you're um, if the mind inclines towards it. But really, the main experience, because usually, hopefully, when we meditate, it's quiet. <laughs> there's not that many sounds and not that many distractions. But hopefully, it's not always the case. But <laughs> we there the mind will still there will be possibility of being aware of these, but that's not going to be the main experience of the mind. The main experience will be detached from these senses. The first four jhanas are the preliminary step-by-step -step to letting go completely of these senses. And then when we go beyond that, this sense of endless space in another sutta for example, the Buddha says, he explains th these bases of liberation, these stages of liberation. Basically, each one of them is a liberation in itself. And what happens um, here is that when, when we still have awareness of body, example, for, for in, in the previous jhanas, it's not that it's completely out you know, at that time, but it's mainly fade fading away. It's not becoming less and less the main experience. All these forms and senses, which is uh, nanata, that, that diversity, all the that complexity of diversity. As we, with six senses, I mean, there, that means there's a lot going on <laughs> all the time. And these this form, this matter, is what really is making the mind really um, limited in a, in, in a sense because these are very conceptual things these are very material you know tangible things and when the world of the f forms is completely faded away and we go into mind only then there is there is this really sharp quite sharp collectedness at that point but mind doesn't have a body <laughs> what is mind is mind it's it's boundless it doesn't have a it, it's body is body mind is something else <laughs> so there's not these sense of limits they come with form mostly right so when when the forms fade away when there's only mind the first impression that kicks, <laughs> if I may say, because it's kind of like this contact, which it contacts a person, is such an open space because that's the realm of the mind. And that's why this is one the first immaterial space. Being aware of this, a person does not experience these previous sense fields. Now, that doesn't mean that if something arises, you won't be aware of it. Yes, but you just let it go and it just 
fades away like everything else and back into the moment. Also, friend, by going beyond all perceptions of the plane of endless space, knowing there is endless consciousness, one experiences and abides in the plane of endless consciousness. Being aware of this also, a person does not experience these previous sense fields. In the, in the discourse, uh, the Buddha kind of... Um, says explains like this each of these bases as a, con a counterpart of the other one basically and so when this sense of boundless space arises which is another see it's another it's pretty vast it's pretty expansive right it's not it's not it's not narrowed down De definitely not it's probably the, it's the opposite and so when the when these even these perceptions that are quite can be quite s subtle in themselves although we arrive there upasampada that's one of the descriptions of each of the jhana we arrive there upasampada and uh, um, we we harati and we live there we we st we meditate in that space it becomes it takes a bit to settle you know it takes a bit to arrive and then it's we arrive there and then it settles we had and then we we dwell there for a while and that's that's explaining exactly what happens when these qualities arise we arrive there and then it settles and then we see that plain clearly but even these perceptions because we don't stop there we continually let go <laughs> and of course i didn't explain like the whole boundless love and thing before that i'm going straight to the <laughs> the mind here um but uh this this is technically the limit of uh, boundless joy also consciousness uh, endless consciousness where now that sense of spaciousness is will also kind of fade away but this is very subtle it's not easy it's not easy easy to see and what will be come what will become the main stage of awareness will be how consciousness itself is endless is just arising and passing away and arising and passing away and is this is this really me am i really doing this oh that's interesting not really <laughs> and we continue letting go and whatever arises whatever arises is just a hindrance <laughs> even you thinking i can't do it hindrance Oh, oh uh, my meditation is bad hindrance <laughs> it's all the same just see every time it's gonna arise it's gonna make tension and you just let it go smile and just enjoy come back when there is joy everything else falls away the the, the hindrances they'll just fall away they just have no chance <laughs> sorry <laughs> so we just continue continue whatever it is name it it's always gonna be just a hindrance one more thing to let go also friend by going beyond the plane of endless consciousness knowing there is nothing in particular one experiences and abides in the plane of bare awareness or nothingness being aware of this also, a person does not experience these previous sense fields. And of course, this is, you know, this is often, this is would be a retreat material, I guess, more. Uh, it's because it takes either a retreat to have the momentum to kind of establish that, or having done a retreat, then this is, this is well known and this is kind of ongoing uh, practice um, 
because this would normally to uh, to an untrained mind it's in itself would, would take quite a bit of dedication quite a quite a few hours of sitting it's not impossible at all it's very possible uh, uh, but uh, these these deeper levels and even though we've might have tasted them before someone who might have tasted them before they make an impression on the mind so they don't they don't necessarily leave but it's really good to remember that sitting for a long time will really make these states stronger again so that's really the path there's no like a it's not like there's a shortcut or anything <laughs> like th that it's already a pretty good shortcut but um to really remember i'm i'm saying because i'm going for a while <laughs> so i I'm, i just want to make sure that you know this is this is good it's good to sit a long time once in a while because <laughs> uh, i it's, it's really important it's, and so many insights come up so sometimes we we overlook it and uh, we, we sit and then it's like oh yeah i forgot about all of these things <laughs> and then it's 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 a really good reminder um happens to me every day <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> right i mean this this kind of like that's why we practice it's that's to remember sati <laughs> so um i think that's one of the best advice i can give is remembering that like I'm, uh, like I'm not saying that it's not impossible that you don't remember at all these states. It is very possible, and it's really, it's, it is what it is. But uh, remembering to take uh, the time to, because the mind, mind takes time to settle back into these states. And there's no, it's not personal. It's not a thing that special for you or for anybody else. It's just time. It takes time. And now this is number nine, and this is the this is the section. Once, friend, when I when I lived in Saketa's black forest at the deer park, a bikuni who lived amongst the jatilas approached me, paid loving respects, sat down beside me, and asked, "Vante Ananda, that samadhi which is not bent on anything, and does not push it." push away anything that does not come to the dead end of forcefully suppressing and controlling liberated it simply stands there standing there it is content content it is not agitated does that sound familiar <laughs> yes so I've never actually heard that so yes Yes. Uh, yes. Sasankara niganha niganya. Uh, wait. Nigaya. Sasankara. That this is a. Yes. Exactly. This is the part. And this is there is only four suttas in the whole canon, that have. There's two mentions in the later treatises, like the Vibhanga, there's one mention, and Natipakarana, one mention. But I usually discard those, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I, I s always stay to the closer to the suttas. And in the suttas, there's only four suttas that say, and that's a, that's a pretty long sandhi word in Sanskrit. The sandhi means it's all connected together. Uh, so it's Sasankara Nigaya Varita Gato. One word. But broken up, it's Sasankara with forcefully. Niganya is like. like Gaya, uh, Gaya, Ganha is like grasping, controlling. or uh, But Niganya would be like suppressing. And Varita Gato is. Uh, Varita Gato is. Um, that which I've translated as coming to the dead end because that's how I felt in my own practice 
but that's just personal, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> because I've practiced similar practices. And that's uh, varita. Varita basically means uh, something that comes in that is a hindrance. Basically, varita is an obstruction to you. Gato is. We cannot always translate Pali, you know, like exactly like that. It's like varita gato, varita gata has its own particular meaning also as being, you know, s something that comes upon a hindrance or hindered or um, obstructed. So, sasankara with force, nigandha, suppressing, controlling. Varita gato is like being oppressed, uh, being hindered by that. Um, now, the, the thing is that I, I, I would love to give a talk on all four suttas, but it's a bit, it would be a bit lengthy. Um, there is, um, so the other one, well, I will read it after, but there's another one well, where he, um, the Buddha compares, it's the gold panner, gold panner sutta, where he says, um, he compares it to removing the gross defilements of gold he compares it to removing the gross defilements of the mind and um so basically like like somebody who's gold panning would pick out the rocks and pick out all this this stuff that is worthless or in a gold panning <laughs> gold panner's mind <laughs> anyways um and uh would pick up the the gold nuggets and then he would uh, after that he would just like uh, i don't know like break some things that are on it and then he, they would melt it and melt the the dross like the finer defilements and so he compares that to the mind also one who is bent on the higher mind the training of the higher mind um, first let's go of the coarse uh, defilements uh, of the mind and that's the virtue so the misconduct of body speech and mind he says then once that's done there's the middling defilements, he says, which are connected to uh, 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 family, social status, and things like that. Um, was it caste or something? And, and then he says, and then there's only thoughts of the Dharma left. And then he says, but that is not peaceful and sublime. This is not, still not, you know, the practice. It's still not, even though it's really good, it's still not, you know, the bright purity of the mind. And he uses that sequence also to say, uh, because the, these thoughts of the Dhamma, he says that those are with Sankaras, Sasankara, Nigaya, and Varita Gato. It says, I mean, it's going to keep you hindered because you're constantly forcing to bring these up. But the Dhamma is man made for you to let all of that go <laughs> because you, we need to also let go of the Dhamma. We can't carry Dhamma and Jhana, the, our thinking. You know, we can bring wholesome thoughts in the first Jhana, but then second, no, no more. So, um, so this path is... W w it's good that we study it so that we know and then it comes up naturally but um, it also we need to let it go and um, and then he says and then once these thoughts are let go of then it's this samadhi is attained by without forcing without there's nothing that hinders the mind then because the mind is not engaged in any kind of way whatsoever. It's just very wholesome and open and bright. The other one is um, when Devadatta sends the, tries to kill the Buddha, tries to murder the Buddha. And Devadatta is, <laughs> and uh, yes, that's really not good karma, by the way. <laughs> and nobody can kill the Buddha, actually. Uh, it can only, uh, like a Sammasam Buddha, a, a fully awakened Buddha. Um, they can only sh shed his blood a little bit 
somehow and he he just pushes a boulder while the buddha's meditating on uh, in rajgaha and uh, i think it was vulture's peak maybe where he used to be on the mountain and uh the rock just hits another rock and then it just breaks open and there's a shard that just lands on the buddha's foot and it just slices it quite good and uh, jivaka the physician of the buddha just uh, kind of treats it and everything but um while the buddha is experiencing because the even buddhas are experiencing painful sensations <laughs> um he is um because of his unshakable samadhi he's 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 just mindful of whatever piercing sharp feeling threatening to life and all these things like the sequence that they say for that and um the some some 700 devas come and see, see the buddha and uh, they all say uh, one of them says um, what a naga of, of, a, of a contemplative is that contemplative for he's he's enduring these uh, painful feelings without even getting agitated without even like showing any sign of and then the the other the other one is uh, what a what a bull of a man <laughs> is that contemplative what a bull of a what a bull of a contemplative is this and then the other one is um, I don't know if I'll remember all of them but what a load bearer and um, and the last one says witness here this samadhi that is unshakable and is not reined in or leaning towards anything or pushing away anything it's just there it has a particular sequence i mean i i'm sorry i can't <laughs> say the, the exact sequence but he says witness this samadhi of a great contemplative and then there's this little like uh, verses at the end saying Whoever, um, whoever should think that such such a person should be harmed, <laughs> what is there in that but delusion itself? And you know, uh, you know, try to try to harm a Buddha who's actually only have compassion for all living beings. You know, it's like. <laughs> that's the deepest delusion you can have probably so that's why it's such an unwholesome it's one of the six great crimes to shed the blood of a buddha and so that's a quite a long time in the lower planes of the lowest of the lowest planes and that person is still there actually <laughs> not to so um devadatta And then after this, I will just read. It's a very short sutta. I, I will read the reference in the in the uh, limitless or immeasurable samadhi sutta. So bante ananda, that samadhi which is not bent on anything, abhinatta, and does not push away anything, apanatta. That does not come to the dead end of forcefully suppressing and controlling sasankara vigaya varita gato. Liberated, it simply stands there, standing there. It is content, content. It is not agitated. Vimutatta titto, tatitatta santusitto. Santusitatta no paritasati. What did the Buddha declare was the fruit of such samadhi? Oh no, this is getting even more interesting. Once this was said, I replied to her. Sister, this samadhi that is not bent on anything, that does not push away anything, that does not come to the dead end of forcefully suppressing and controlling. Liberated, it, st it simply stands. Standing, it is content. Contented, it is not agitated. 
The awakened one said, the fruition of such samadhi, sister, is final awakening. Being aware of this also, a person does not experience those previous sense fields. So, we have um, confirmation <laughs> of, of the, the practice here and that it, the fruition of it is final awakening, arahantship. And so he is. Yes. Yes. It, it would be leaning forward or bending back. That does not lean forward nor bends back. That is not reined in nor forcefully suppressing bracket the hindrances. The for the hindrances. Oh, I see. I think so. <laughs> if I can remember it like this, but I yes. So very, very yeah, similar, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even if you would change the, the words a little bit, like Tanisa uh, Robiku, because I was just quite looking at it, I translated it just for today. Uh, so Tanisa um, Robiku translates Sankara as fabrication, which would personally I kind of like, but... Um, uh, he he doesn't the thing is that you can interpret here that because sa means with also so sa sankara could be with fabrications or with formations or with what i sometimes call processes or activities or but that's also missing the other um, meaning of the word sankara which means force Forcefully. Sankara means kind of conditioned also or like willfully made or created or so that's Sa Sankara it can also be like uh, with f forced and there's other instances where we find that Sankara doesn't mean formations it means forcing something with force so um, because kara it means doing, sankara would be kind of like <laughs> emphasizing the doing, <laughs> if you may. So, um, and th this is these are these are uh, suttas that are that are quite foundational for us in our practice. They really, you know, they're like the proof if somebody has a question about it. I mean, they can argue with the Buddha, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's their option, you know. <laughs> and so this is, um, the other one is really short um, and it's in the fully open. That's, it's right after I give the instructions on boundless love. And then um, this, this is 24 in that edition. And it's immeasurable samadhi. He says, monks, being wise and continuously present, develop meditation that is immeasurable. Monks doing so, five different understandings are known to arise. One understands this present samadhi is blissful and results in future happiness. Sound familiar? <laughs> the Buddha also and and all the noble people, the Aryas, called this uh, a pleasant abiding meditation, jhana, so sukha vihari. This samadhi, that's the second, this samadhi is wise and beyond material. So that's arya and um, niramisa. This is, niramisa is the word that is used when the Buddha talks about piti, the joy. The joy of the seven supports of awakening, the niramisa piti. And um, this is not associated with any of the senses. This is actually it's just purely sheer mental development joy, <laughs> like bright gold. 
this samadhi is not practiced by unrighteous people. Now, we can, uh, we can concentrate the mind, like making, making focus uh, in many kinds of ways. Now, that, that's possible. And these ways, you don't necessarily need to follow the virtues for that, actually. It will help, yes, like everything else. But, uh, but the, the, <laughs> the, because what happens is when, you, when we put our attention on one single thing, um, and that's where the suppression comes in, when the Buddha says that, um, is that for that time that you are putting this attention there, and whenever the mind turns, or veers away and goes to a kind of a hindrance, that's what the usual instructions would be, you bring it back to that object and you put it there. You place it, a lot of people would say even, you place it on your object kind of thing. But that is forcefully controlling. And what happens is the more you do that, the more, the, the, more, the narrower the focus of attention will be. And that is what suppresses hindrances. Because for that time, the hindrances will not arise. And one might think, I'm very steady, you know, uh, concentrated. But <laughs> the catch is, <laughs> once you come out of that, <laughs> what happens? Is how does that translate in, into a, a broader mental development. First of all, how does it translate to the immeasurable samadhi that the Buddha talks about? Very hard to reconcile these these things. That would be a very, I mean, it's the complete opposite, really. It's very narrowed down and it's very pinpointed. <laughs> but no, the Buddha never never really uses these words. The, the the closest he will use is ekodi bhavan, which is it's it's unified, it's made to be one. But you know, it's it's not it's not like um, um, he uses the word apamana much more uh, immeasurable, not, not boundless, and we have the Brahma Viharas that also support that and. Uh, And so when we when we practice this samadhi that we've been practicing with the Brahma Viharas, with the joy and letting go and love, boundless love, loving kindness, meditation, is part of joy. It it brings that. It it nourishes that. There's and joy will nourish that love also. But our practice is not just about boundless love, <laughs> like we saw in the couple of discourses ago. It's boundless love is m one one part of it, but then there's also mainly understanding distractions, and this is part two. <laughs> there's cultivating a wholesome feeling, which is one part of right effort, wise practice, but then there's also letting go of all the distractions that come up and see this is also where it branches off from the from any kind of pinpoint kind of practice because where's the where's the wisdom in that but the instructions here are no the hindrance are actually showing you what's happening in your mind <laughs> they're not to be suppressed they're not to be pushed away they're to be understood and they're to be let go of that's wisdom that's the four noble truths right there and that's the practice and if in some practices even now i'm talking about many kinds of different practices i'm not naming them but um some practices would focus a lot ab about being aware just being aware but being aware of whatever sensations arise, for example, pain, painful sensations sometimes, a lot of the times, sometimes. Huh? <laughs> but um, that is, 
it's not completely false, but it's incomplete. That's the problem. Because there's not the third noble truth in there. There's not the fourth noble truth, which is all about letting it go. If you're just aware, you're just grow in growing increasingly aware of Dukkha. <laughs> and what you know more and more is Dukkha, 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 Dukkha. But never letting it go. So the hindrance, that's why it's important to understand what it does to us. It does that tension. It comes with tension. And that, that's why the Buddha was so keen on awareness of the body. Because you can always feel it in your body. Then you, can, then you can see it, what it does, and you can feel it. It's not pleasant. And then you can just let it go and see how that feels and bring up a smile <laughs> and bring up the love again. And just doing that, that's all the mind needs to be collected. There's no other choice. If you continually do that, that there's no choice. It's, it has to become collected because that's the Eightfold Path. But we really need to practice the virtues, though, doing this, because there's no repression, there's no suppression. That's why we practice that. That's our practice is about wisdom. So suppression is not wisdom. Suppression is just suppression. It's not wanting to see something. No, our practice is, that's why a lot of people go through a lot of forgiveness at the beginning, because they have to empty the closet first. And then once that's completely out, then there's no more problem. But see, that's the importance of virtue, is that in this particular one, it, it, it just has to happen, because we, we're not going to suppress anything. It's just all going to come. <laughs> so we need to be, we need to be straight with our, uh, with our own selves. So that means doing good. So this samadhi is not practiced by unrighteous people. It's impossible. How could somebody practice this kind of samadhi, which is like boundless love <laughs> and letting go? <laughs> How could that person do wrong? It's impossible. They would have to stop doing it and do something. <laughs> that's because that's, I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. There's no other, there's no other way. F and now four, this samadhi is peaceful and sublime, obtained through calming down, attained by mental unity, not by forcefully holding back and pushing away. See, that's where it comes in. Where do we find, now I'm going to test you, where do we find this Peaceful and sublime. Santang and Panidang. <laughs> In the beautiful. Well, that's a good answer, but it's... Um, um, in, a, in a definition that is... You can find in the chanting book, too. That defines... Is a tang santang a tang panidang, and I've been telling you a few times. I'm just trying to <laughs> make you work a little bit. Yadidang sabba sankara samato, sabupadi patinisago, tanha kayo virago nirodo nibana. So. Here it's a bit of a it's it's different it's a different version it's not it's not the definition of nibbana because uh, what I just said is this is peaceful this is sublime the that is the calming of all mental activities sabba sankara samato sabupadi patinisago upadi all the all the acquisition all the grasping the relinquishing all that all the tension. Mm. Tanha kayo, the, the end of craving, the end of agitation. Uh, virago, calming down. Nirodo, release. Nibbana, blowing out. Nibbana. But this is, he's talking about here, this, this particular samadhi. So, see here the connection. It's very, it's not, it's not far. 
this Nibbana element and its definition and this Samadhi he's talking about, like this is the practice and the goal. It's not, it's not completely different. So this Samadhi is peaceful and sublime, obtained through calming down. This is the same thing as the Nibbana. Um, attained by mental unity. This is a Ikodi Bhava, Ikodi Bhava uh, Adigato. This is attain, has attained to mental unity. Not by forcefully holding back and pushing away. And the fifth is I am aware while entering it and aware while emerging from it. So this whole process is just very mindful. There's no, you know, extreme place where there is a steep cutoff where you just like, you know, dive into a kind of you know, like something that's way. No, this this whole process is very. Um, it's all present. It's all very mindful, and it's no. It's not. It's not particularly extreme. It's very. Uh, there's a whole path, yes, with many steps, but. It's a very mindful thing, and when you when you enter, when you start, and uh, let's say that that kind of practice more dedicatedly, like sitting, and when you stop, there's no major break. Like the transition between your living life and the meditation is very harmonious. There's no. There's no. Uh, f for me, for example, there was a time where there was a pra I was practicing something that I that's one thing that was really that really struck me was that um, I would do a 10 day retreat and I would be very focused, <laughs> but then I would be serving for three days and it would be all gone. <laughs> I was like, whoa, OK, like I just want to do another 10 days, but what's going to happen after this one like i'm just going to lose it after again like two days after or three days after but this practice is different this practice is about wholesome mental development it's about personality change it's about personality development and what the meditation and living life more and more they there's not a very clear different cut or difference between them it's well of course you want to sit you want to sit <laughs> <laughs> you need to sit <laughs> but um there is um it's much more harmonious and integrated and you can uh, really find yourself really blissing out while you're cooking even you know even <laughs> you're just you can maintain that samadhi very easily if you maintain the love, for example, which is very universal, obviously. And it's uh, you just have to make a, a bit of an effort, yes, to kind of, yes, I will make an effort to kind of stay with that and see what happens, like whatever you do. And things might be like a little bit slower, but it will be, everything will be very, very much aware, very much aware the mind will remain collected and so that's why we say metta is also a, a practice that is a, it's not just a sitting practice also but it's an all the time we want to try to find any kind of reason to bring that up anything like it it works <laughs> so this is the special samadhi of the buddhas <laughs> just touching lightly on it I find it you, you drop the attachment to experience. Yes. You just are experience. Yes. Uh, uh, that's practice. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we practice, it, we need the meditation too. So yes. To give us the tools to really. Yes. Yes. The thing is, we, uh, yes. 
what I was noticing for me, and I use me because I don't want to use anybody else or I don't want to name anything or I don't want it. So that's why I talk about my own experience because so that it, it's actually contained them. That's one thing I, I would notice was that what I was practicing uh, for quite a long time. And at that point, I, I knew on, only this or very f little. And I was looking a lot of my my nostril tips, basically. And one of the major insights I got from that was that it's so hard to maintain with whatever you're doing because everything becomes a hindrance then and you have to repress everything because if, if you want to keep your attention there, then it's hard. It's Everything is hard to do. Every, everything because everything is a distraction. Everything, you, you don't want to do anything because it's like it's it's going to break my it's going to break my concentration. So, and then inevitably there comes many problems with that. I'm not going to go too far in details, but <laughs> I, and actually, you know, some people who push that kind of uh, practice very far, um, the, and, and perhaps maybe are, have some backgrounds for that, but a lot of people actually develop mental instabilities be because it's actually, um, um, pushing this kind of uh, how do you call it um, OCD or something because it's it's really about obsessing about something and pushing away everything else that's not what we're doing we're accepting everything that comes and we're learning to change our mind, to let go of what's going on, let go of the attachment that I want it to be different, I want it to be like this, I want it to be like that. Let it go, and the mind becomes collected by joy and love. The, the, you don't need to force anything for that to happen. And that is universal in whatever you do. You can, you can even chop wood if you want. <laughs> of course it's yeah <laughs> there's easier times than others i guess <laughs> but um so yeah did you have any any questions about the buddha special samadhi So we share notes or you have okay good um, I guess before I forget then it's my time to uh, I have all of <laughs> all of you <laughs> I have all of you here um, and I want to uh, ask for your forgiveness so if I've said or done anything whether by body by speech or by mind that has come across as hurtful to you or has caused damage whether material or emotional or mental uh, please forgive me sincerely Maybe we ask uh, forgiveness to the Buddha and Dharma and the Sangha. Kayena wa chachitena pamadena maya katam achayam kamame bante buri panya tatagata. By way of body, speech, or mind, if I have done any negligent actions, please forgive me, O Bhante, truth finder of vast wisdom. Kayena wa chachitena pamadena maya katam achayang kamame dhamma. Sanditi ka kalika 
by way of body, speech, or mind, if I have done any careless actions, please forgive me, Nang Dhamma. Directly visible and timeless. Kayena vaja chittena pamadena maya katang achayam kamame sangha supati panna nukkara. By way of body, speech, or mind, for any careless actions of mine, please forgive me, O Sangha. Walking the right path, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. Dukkha patta jani dukkha, bhaya patta jani bhaya, soka patta jani soka, hontu sabbe pipani. Nidang no punyang sabbe sabta ni no dantu, sabba sampati siddhiya, aka satta chabu matta, deva naga mai bhikkha. Punyang tang anu moritwa, chirang rakantu buddha sasasana. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth. Devas and Nagas of mighty powers share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha Sasanas.